The sports and fitness industry is seeing remarkable growth, especially as technological innovations continue to enhance the performance and overall experience products can provide consumers. The Sports and Fitness Industry Association, also known as the SFIA, works with many top brands to strengthen the sports and fitness community. Joining us now are John Peters, Vice President of Business Development for the SFIA, and Finnegan partner Aaron Parker, leader of the firm's Mechanical Practice Group and the firm's Sports, Fitness, and Outdoor Recreation Industry Working Group. Thanks for joining us today, John. We look forward to talking about trends in the sports and fitness industry, technology in sports, and the influx of technology in sports, and, and a little bit about how the trade war with China is affecting this industry. But before we get into that discussion, what is your role with the Sports and Fitness Industry Association? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on, Aaron. It's going to be a fun one. So I, I manage business development for the SFIA, the vice president of BizDev, and basically think of us as a, a trade association representing anyone who makes products for fitness and sports. And so that spans across you know, some retailers and brands and even startups. So our, our companies are, you know, we were about 500 members wide and everyone from, you know, Amazon and Nike all the way down to smaller companies like Sensei and everything in between. So New Balance and Brooks would be, be in there as well. So it kind of runs the gamut between sports, retail, fitness, footwear, and manufacturers representing those. And how long have you been with the SFIA? So I've been here, man, I think it's been about seven years. Time flies when, when you're having fun, as they say. Kind of stumbled upon it based in Washington, D.C., and been able to kind of lead the charge with our team here on some events and different innovations. And our research, as, as you well know, Aaron, you've been Finnegan's been featured in our annual research reports, which we can talk about as well. But in essence, we're almost like a not-for-profit consultant for the brands in the industry. So you mentioned that research, as I, I know – annually the SFIA publishes research. Can you talk a little bit about that research? Yeah, sure. So I'll back up a little bit. We do about 100 reports a year, and it's mostly everything participation focused. So we're pretty much the gold standard for anything sports fitness participation. So, you know, we track how many people walk a year versus run versus play soccer, tackle football, obviously, with what's been going on lately these past few years with safety on the field. We've been definitely working with that and even testifying on Capitol Hill. Our CEO has done that for the NFL and Commissioner Goodell. So it really runs a gamut, but it's very beneficial for a lot of our companies and even some of our retailers who use a lot of our data to actually heat map what's going on in what areas. So how many kids in the Pacific Northwest are playing lacrosse this year versus flag football, which speaks of trends has been a really bright, positive trend for football led by heads up in the NFL and USA football. Seven on seven football has been really interesting. So everyone, especially the media, wants to talk about the death of tackle football. And while it's true they've lost probably a million players or so in the last several years, there have been new activities, seven-on-seven football, flag football, that are kind of sprouting up, and a lot of those players are shifting to those activities instead of the traditional tackle football. So while the numbers relating to traditional tackle football look down, it doesn't necessarily appear that all those kids are going to other sports. They're just going to kind of derivatives of the game of football? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say that, and there's been a great initiative by each professional league, particularly the NHL and Major League Baseball, who have a, a huge focus on growing the game. So one of the, the trends that we see year after year, we saw it again this year, is the idea of sports specialization. And so if, if you're listening and have a kid who plays soccer, Aaron, um, you may know that <laughs> kids who, uh, by the time you're 12, a lot of programs may be pressuring kids to double down on that sport and, and just play that sport year round. And so where I'm going with all of this is Major League Baseball for the past five years implemented their play ball campaign, which has nothing to do with being specialized. In fact, it's the exact opposite. So they went into inner city Baltimore where they just rolled out balls and bats and got kids just hitting the ball and kids as young as four. And so that was five or six years ago. And a lot of our data would suggest it worked because baseball for having such a large base of players actually saw an uptick of 6% of this year from last year. So th those are some of the policy initiatives with Project Play and on Capitol Hill that with congressmen and women, we've, we've kind of shed some light on problems with youth sports. Have you seen any changes recently in you know, how active um, maybe the older folks are, not talking about kids as much, but the general population? 
Yeah, for sure. So a couple of things with the aging population and the boomers definitely see an uptick year after year in, in walking for exercise. So we do a survey every year that asks 40,000 or so households in the U.S., did you do any of these activities for sport, fitness, and if so, how many times? And then we get really granular into zip codes and how many times he did it, et cetera. This year, the number stayed about flat. Almost 27, 28% of Americans identified as they did not. So 28% of Americans did not do a single activity from a list of 100 one time. That's pretty alarming. That's kind of the narrative that we always focus on as a company and as a mission statement to the industry, because I think for our industry, more people playing is better for business and also healthcare and everything else. So we have a big day in Capitol Hill, Aaron, as you've been to a few times with athletes and the lobby senators about our, our bills around this. And so we'll keep fighting the good fight. That's kind of our altruistic, bigger picture mission. So I'd like to, I'd like to transition a little bit and talk about kind of the influx of technology in sports. And it's across all sports, as, as you know, probably more than most people, because you're really tied into the industry. To segue into that, I wanted to briefly mention the SFIA's Industry Leader Summit. You guys do this the fascinating startup challenge, and I know you started it a number of years ago, and it, I found it very interesting every year because the, the five companies or the five finalists that you guys bring in that gets like, pitched to the group. We've had great companies for the past five years, but I felt like even this year, I mean, all, all five of these companies really have some interesting technology, and it seemed to be raising the bar each year. So our Industry Leader Summit is a collection of 250 executives in the industry, and obviously, big thanks. I'll take a time to plug Finnegan Henderson, who's been a supporter. You guys have been involved with us pretty much since day one, which has been awesome because it's a collection of C-level folks from brands like, again, Under Armour and Asics and Amazon, and the Walmart head of sports and fitness is there, and Dix has been several times. So it's a really cool place, and, and lately we've seen a lot more investors show up. So Aaron Rodgers' fund, RX3 Ventures, was there looking for kind of deal flow, as they call it. North Castle Partners, who's, who's invested in Flywheel and a bunch of others. So we've seen this confluence of interesting new upstarts, plus brands, retailers, and now investor groups and accelerators. And it's kind of this, become this really cool franchise for SFIA to highlight innovation to the industry. They've raised a ton of money, over $100 million, But the coolest thing about the 20, now it's 21 companies who've been featured, I think, is we've seen companies on site raise capital. So being able to help facilitate a lot of that has been really, really rewarding. I mean, in essence, we created this contest so upstarts could kind of launch into a new level, if you will, of, of their business. And so we've seen companies get into retailers, find manufacturing and sourcing. We've seen companies partner up with Brooks running. The CEO of Brooks is on our board, and so they've been able to establish a great relationship with Brooks. So I think overall, it's been a great way to highlight innovation and really foster small business and entrepreneurship. I mean, I don't know of any contest today that you can go and talk to the head of innovation for Under Armour, North Castle Partners, who have a $500 million fund, and then go talk to the GM of Walmart.com and, and Walmart. So it's a really cool opportunity for companies. And this year, I think you're right. We definitely raise the bar again in terms of the, the talent. I think one thing we've noticed is, you know, we've been doing this event for four years, the Startup Challenge event for four years, and we're continuing to see more early stage innovations. And I think that's awesome. I, I think a lot of people in our industry kind of harp on, well, oh, retail's dead and there's no innovation. And I just, I don't think it's true at all. I, I think it's exactly the opposite. And so I always say, maybe I'm spending my time with too many companies who don't make any money because a lot of these are early stage, but being able to take them to a company like New Balance and say, this company could help you. And so specifically, the winner this year, Miro AI, it's M-I-R-O, they've been an early stage company, been around for two years, and you're probably like, how does artificial intelligence relate to our industry? So Miro built a, an algorithm to track and measure every logo that is across a run race. And so they partner with run race cameras. They have this camera vision technology that tags automatically what runner is wearing, what brand of shoe. And so you can imagine the cool data that they're able to give back to somebody like Brooks or New Balance or Hoka 1-1 and say at the end of the race, this age demographic and females, most of them were wearing Brooks or most of them were wearing Nikes, whatever it is. So those insights around that. And then a couple of the other companies, they're really going after an automated way for team dealers to service the uniform market. We saw Tao, who's built a patented solution around resistance training. So literally, you think about resistance 
bands inside of your yoga pants. They've blended the fabric and technology there, which is super cool. And then Perch, another AI company that just got a huge deal with LSU and and some other big, big athletic programs. They actually measure everything form in the gym. So again, camera vision technology, being able to say, Aaron, your squat was a little bit off and you need to tweak your knee or you could have a knee injury. The biggest problem with sports and technology right now and will continue to be is I think there's a lot of technologies today kind of overhyped. I think a lot of technologies are looking for problems to solve, and I think it should be the opposite way. I think this year all five companies that we saw were solving problems. They were actually addressing serious needs in the industry, and it wasn't just another fitness tracker or, you know, a wrist wearable or something like that. I think this year represented the the top class and tons of innovations all across the globe, I would say. So I guess the last transition, because I, you know, we don't want to talk forever, even though I think we could. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of things we could be talking about, but I, I did want to mention the issue of tariffs, and I know SFIA does a lot of great things for their member companies relating to tariffs. And so I wanted to ask you, first of all, how the tariffs have affected member companies, and then speak a little bit about what the SFIA is doing for their members and can do for others in, in the sports and fitness and outdoor industries. Regardless of your political viewpoints or or what you think about trade, it's just been very hard to keep up with. So we've been able to service our members and play a huge role on duty relief and filing petitions. And so list three, which is the most recent round, and list four will presumably come out in a couple weeks here. Essentially, list three, if you make a bag or piece of footwear in China, you're probably getting hit on that. And so we have been filing lots of petitions, and and while some of them have been successful, a lot of them haven't been. And so the good thing about SFIA is a lot of our members leverage our reach, our clout in Washington, and we're able to kind of use economies of scale with all of our members to get the cost down to actually file a petition for duty relief. And so we successfully did that for a lot of companies with the miscellaneous tariff bill and the GSP bill years ago. And this time around, we've done it for list three and list four. Basically, essentially, list four will hit everyone if you're making any products in China. And so we're kind of gearing up for that and helping members kind of just navigate what's going on with that. And a couple of things I would say about the whole China thing is we've had major footwear CEOs tell us that they don't play musical chairs with their supply chain. And so they, a lot of them have moved a lot of their production out of China, and a lot of them are planning to move most of their, I would say the majority of their production. And the musical chairs comment is really just represents they're not coming back. And so you're seeing countries like Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand and Sri Lanka, a lot of companies are starting to get business from a lot of our members. And the other thing I'd say is, around just China in general, you know, there's this perception that tariffs are attacks on consumers, and I think that's true. It's interesting, however, because we haven't seen yet from List 3 the impact on consumers. And so when List 4 hits, a lot of CEOs from major sports medicine and footwear and apparel brands have told us that if List 4 does hit, they, they will have no choice but pass it on to the consumer. So, so essentially, they've been eating the cost up until this point, and it's going to just get to a tipping point where we believe that the prices for consumers will, in fact, go up inevitably if nothing's kind of resolved. And so is that 10% more for your Brooks running shoe or Nike shoe or your apparel? Apparel's been the one that's been kind of under the radar a little bit, but with List 4, basically all apparel is going to get taxed pretty heavily here. So I think that even we had a trade subject at the Industry Leader Summit, Aaron, and I think everyone would agree, no matter how much of an expert you are, nobody really knows what to expect, which kind of makes this a little bit annoying for a lot of companies who are trying to plan for their supply chain and product pipeline 12 months from now. And so that's the perspective we have on China and and trade. Yeah, no, I think that's my my understanding as well, is that the hit is coming and we're going to feel it soon, especially if the tariffs for List 4 go through. So what can companies do if they're members or they aren't members of the SFIA? Should they reach out to you guys and if they have issues or questions or or want to kind of get in on filing one of these petitions that might relate to the the product they sell? SFIA.org is probably the easiest way to to learn more. Our, Our website has just tons of information around everything, Capitol Hill legislation policy. Even if you're not a member of SFIA, we've gotten companies like Bose and and others who are going to participate. And I guess I would say this as a closing point. The reason we exist is 
are for moments like this, meaning when we have 200 or so companies or whatever the number is going to be filing a lot of the petitions, we're able to basically get that cost down to a ridiculously low number, given that so many companies are participating in the same list. So for list four, we're going to see probably double the companies from, from list three apply. And it's a very seamless process anyway, if you're, if you don't like, cause a lot of our companies don't have a, an in-house counsel or a compliance or a trade manager. And if, if you don't have a sourcing person on staff, it's like a foreign language. I mean, I look at this stuff every week with SFIA and I still don't understand a lot of the HTS codes and, and different things. So just look at us as a resource and if we can help, happy to do so. Our guests have been John Peters, Vice President of Business Development for the SFIA and Aaron Parker, a partner at Finnegan, one of the largest IP law firms in the world. For more commentary on intellectual property news and issues, to listen to other podcasts, and to receive additional information on the firm, please visit www.finnegan.com. And for more information on the SFIA, please visit sfia.org. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Finnegan.